Uh, today we are here to have a conversation with uh, Bob Weinberg. Um, I don't know how many of you know it, but <clears throat> Bob uh, has spent his entire career here at MIT, um, even his juvenile career. Um, he received his undergraduate degree here in 1964. <clears throat> and a, PhD in 1969, and he was appointed an assistant professor in 1973, and he's now director of the Ludwig Center for Molecular Oncology. So as I added up, that's 44 years, roughly, at MIT. But you shouldn't get the wrong impression that his celebrity doesn't out extend outside of Cambridge. Um, <clears throat> I count that Bob has received 62 awards for his scientific research, which uh, is truly extraordinary. Uh, many of them uh, highly coveted awards that you would, uh, of course, uh, be aware of. One of them, which um, Bob could explain to me, is the Lucy Wortham James Award for the Society for Surgical Oncology, um, <clears throat> which is a little strange. I didn't know that he uh, was a surgeon. Um, he's also a noted textbook, author of a noted textbook on cancer, and has been the subject of um, other notable um, books, not novels, but um, <clears throat> close to biographies. Um, one of the things that I think strikes us as colleagues of Bob is uh, his devotion to teaching <clears throat> and to MIT. And uh, his, he's a really good citizen. Uh, I note on a number of occasions when he walks in front of the Whitehead that he will pick up a piece of paper that has been errantly thrown in, in front of the Whitehead and put it in the garbage. Um, so I think of him, as many of us do, not just as a colleague, but as a really good friend someone who we can count on if you ask him to do something, uh, to do it to the end. This talk is called A Conversation with Bob Weinberg. <clears throat> and I should mention that my first conversation with Bob Weinberg uh, was when he was an assistant professor in 1977, um, when he was on a committee for the American Cancer Society. It's a little hard to remember when, uh, when he was, for him, I'm sure, and even for me when he was starting out. But I remember this conversation quite well because I was head of the American Cancer Society Cell Biology uh, Committee, and we reviewed, reviewed grants. And Bob was the only assistant professor on that committee. And after the review, one of the review sessions, he came up to me and he said, we're going to have to go off this committee. And I said, why? You're doing, you're, you're great. And he said, I'm coming up for tenure, and I have to really focus on my research. <clears throat> I think that uh, gave me a sense of Bob's honesty and integrity. And uh, I look forward to hearing about his early days, even before I first met him and had this conversation. Well, to be honest, I've never thought of myself as a particularly interesting person. And I expected, therefore, for there to be five or six people here, mostly people from my lab. <laughs> and so I am uh, stunned by this turnout. Uh, preparing for this, as I did, I tried to dig back into uh, my old roots to try to figure out why I am the way I am. Um, 
they're di my roots are different from many other people's, but they, they do shed light on uh, many aspects of me and my personality. Uh, I grew up in a family of refugees. I was born in 42, but my parents got out of Germany in 38. And so for the first teenage years of my life, I was deeply immersed in the, uh, the life, the history, and the psyche of refugees. And this actually imprinted itself, I think, rather deeply on my uh, personality. My uh, grandfather, with whom I grew up and was very close, was a uh, wine merchant uh, in, in Strasbourg and later in Dortmund in Germany. Um, after his bar mitzvah in 1892, he became a, an apprentice to a barrel maker and, and a winemaker in Bonn. And uh, after he was arrested in 1938 and put into a concentration camp, he got out after six or eight weeks, apparently because he didn't have anything more than a parking ticket to his name, uh, went over to England and was promptly interned there after the war began as an enemy alien. He had the best six months of his life there because he was put in a former country club by the Brits. And then he came over in 1940. And in the States, he became logically enough a sewing machine repairman. And so I spent many, many hours with him down in the basement of our house with all his tools, uh, working on, on, on taking apart sewing machines. And then as I grew older, taking apart and putting together electric trains and pinball machines and all kinds of electrical gadgets, which fascinated me then. And I think uh, began to lay down the neural circuitry for my interest in how cells operate, because after all, much of the logic is the same. Um, my father, that is his son-in-law, um, grew up under difficult circumstances. His father uh, was a, a cattle dealer, horse and cattle dealer. Um, and he made a big mistake uh, in 1915, which explains some of what Jerry attributes to me as being an example of good citizenship. Uh, he was selling uh, uh, horses to the Prussian cavalry in the First War and uh, wishing to sell a particularly nice horse to a procurement officer from the army. He went into the stall and found out that his stable boy had forgotten to take all the straw out of the bottom of the stall. And so he reached in compulsively to pick it up was kicked in the belly and was dead three days later from peritonitis. My father, many decades, he, my father was still very young then, my father decades later would go through uh, our lawn in Pittsburgh where I grew up picking up individual leaves off the ground. And so I think what Jerry attributed to me as an example of good citizenship is a hardwired compulsion to pick up <laughs> all, all kinds of detritus off the ground and put it in its, uh, its rightful place. Uh, my, uh, my, my father uh, studied dentistry in Germany and then uh, practiced for a while. Um, in 33, after Hitler came to power, he began to uh, smuggle money to his brother-in-law, who lived then in the Netherlands, anticipating that things would go from bad to worse, which they did. And so when he arrived here in 1938, he had $20,000 in his pocket, which is serious money in those days, and allowed him to pay his way through a second dental school to get recertified. And so I grew up in Pittsburgh uh, with a dentist father who had gone from one coal dust city, Dortmund, in the middle of the Ruhr, to an even dirtier one, Pittsburgh, PA. And uh, somehow during all those years, many of their histories uh, percolated into my consciousness and I think influenced very much the way I am today. My grandfather uh, was one of eight. Uh, five of them were either killed or committed suicide to avo avoid uh, deportation during the war. And uh, although he was a reasonably cheerful person, uh, there were just certain things that were off topic. We wouldn't discuss them. They were somehow too painful to discuss, including, I imagine, his six weeks in a concentration camp. Um, my father was a rather successful dentist. My grandfather, a successful wine merchant. And one thing that was made apparent to me was that no matter how successful and established one was, in the end, it didn't all matter. And that from one day or one year to the next, one could be riding high and then be catapulted into the, um, into the chasm. And so uh, Jerry has talked about all of these recognitions and uh, I kind of have always reacted to them uh, as it said in Ecclesiastes, vanity of vanities, that um, 
even though uh, one is recognized by one's peers, even though one lives with the what have you done for me lately syndrome that permeates our profession, um, even if you continue to do things lately, uh, it's all a mirage and that to the extent that we feel ourselves successful and productive and respected, uh, it can change very rapidly and that uh, our lives and our careers are very precarious. Um, I uh, am very grateful that I grew up in this country, to state the obvious. My father loved this country. He said, you know, the one thing about Americans that I really like is they're such decent, nice people. And that made a big impression on me. Um, but he also told me a lot of other things that somehow permeated the way I think. Uh, one thing he said to me was, um, it's okay to be successful and productive, but don't be too visible lest the guys in the brown shirts come in one night and take you away. And uh, if I had taken everything he said to heart, I probably wouldn't be sitting here today because here you are looking at me. Uh, <laughs> I have singled myself out and, and made myself very visible. Indeed, I have been rather visible in the world. But I always have echoing in my, my voice the, what my father told me. Don't be too visible. Don't let your head stick above the crowd because one day the bad guys could come and take you away. And uh, you would think, well, that's old-fashioned foolishness, but things you hear from your parents early in life are deeply permeating, permeating your, uh, your consciousness, your psyche, and never really go away. Um, it's nice to receive um, recognition. It's nice to be... Um, uh, to receive prizes and awards. Jerry counted them up, although I must say I never have. Uh, even the Society for Surgical Oncologists that he cited. Um, but it, it's all a mirage, and uh, for me, what energizes me is the day-to-day -day process of doing science and being with young people, which is, which is uh, wonderful simply because it allows me, even though I'm getting older, to have the, uh, the illusion, the mirage, that I'm just like the graduate students, which I was at, at one time. Um, <clears throat> my tinkering uh, with electric trains, which was my passion uh, already then, also went to uh, other sources. I was very interested in our history because my father would talk on many occasions about this and that family. And so in 1957, I started a new hobby. Um, my genealogy. And in the succeeding 51, 52 years, I now have put three or 4,000 people on the Weinberg family tree, all descended from the man in 1675 who allegedly gave me my Y chromosome. So it's gone back many generations. And this is a passion and is reflective, as I think about it, of my interest and my desire to try to bury underneath. Where did it all come from? How did we start? Where do the roots go? Uh, a, a, an interest which translates itself in my own <clears throat> work directly to trying to understand the evolutionary history of how we got to be on this planet. How did metazoan life evolve? How um, could organismic complexity arise from simplicity? And how does a simple cell figure out what it's supposed to be doing, which is ultimately the major question in uh, trying to understand uh, the biology of cancer. I was an okay, but not great student in, in Pittsburgh, uh, friends of the family had sons who went to MIT. And so my parents, not knowing anything about American colleges and universities, said, why don't you try it? So I applied and I was admitted, not because I knew anything about MIT, but because it was for lack of anything better. And so I ended up here for four years as an undergraduate. Uh, I was not uh, that successful, if, if the truth be known. I was not terribly happy here as an undergraduate because I didn't find many of the other undergraduates as being real soulmates. Uh, I didn't feel that comfortable. And I tried on a couple occasions actually to transfer to Harvard with a more liberal arts um, uh, orientation, uh, which obviously uh, did not succeed. Um, originally, I came to be a pre-med because that's what one did in those days. But when I was a sophomore, I learned that doctors had to stay up all night, that sometimes they had to go uh, 48 hours without getting any sleep. And I said, this isn't for me. And so I switched to becoming a bi biology. 
Now, you think that all of our careers, uh, fates, and decisions are made for profound reasons. But to my mind, uh, the, each, where each of us is, is no more or less of an accident than the accident of which sperm hit which egg in our mother's womb. It's all a bit of a, a roll of the dice. And so I en ended up here for um, totally obscure reasons and ended up in biology for rather inconsequential reasons. And biology was really, uh, if one may say it, rather poorly taught here in those days. I'm talking about the early 1960s. But in 1963, I took a course by Mari Fox, who is still on our faculty, on the then burgeoning area of molecular genetics. Now, in 1963, we knew about DNA. We had begun to learn about uh, messenger RNA, not completely. And we were just learning about the genetic code. And my God, this was exciting for me to, to learn about molecular bacterial genetics and the fact that one could ultimately trace uh, the, uh, the whole mechanics of how cells operated to distinct and discrete molecules, something which fascinates all of us to this day. But for me, this was a revelation. And so my last two years at MIT uh, as an undergraduate were um, much more energized. But I must tell you, as I, as I teach now 701-2, Eric Lander and I, we do 50-50 in the fall, um, that I make a confession to the class uh, in the first or second lecture. I say, class, I have a confession to make, and they all look up. I say, class, I have to tell you that when I took this course in 1961, I got a D, and they all start <laughs> clapping. <laughs> Hysterically. Did I give you permission? to do so, I say, and of course, but that uh, gets them relaxed. Uh, but in fact, it is the historical truth. I don't want to be going into that course under false pretenses. And no, I will not tell you who taught me that uh, course in 1961, because he is still, believe it or not, among us. <laughs> Here at MIT. Imagine how infantilizing it is for me to have as my colleagues now, uh, 48 years later, the people who taught me when I was a freshman and a sophomore. So be it. Um, when it came time for me to apply to a graduate school, uh, I really had no good prospects because my grades were actually rather lousy. They were lousy. But I was taken to MI, into MIT, uh, I think because I'd worked in several labs um, and people knew me and gave me a very strong recommendation for reasons that were obscure to me then and are still to this day. And so I was admitted um, and began my first year of graduate school here in 1964. And then I did something that was most unusual then and now. I took off and I went down because I'd been here for five years. And it is a bit of a, a drag to be here for such long periods of time without getting out once in a while and breathing fresh air. And so uh, I went down to uh, West Alabama and became the biology department in a small black college uh, near the Mississippi border called Stillman. It had about 602 students that, that year. It uh, was integrated. There was one white student and 601 black students. Um, and that was already considered partially integrated. That was the year after uh, Goodman, Schwerner, and Cheney, the three civil rights uh, workers, were buried under a dam in Philadelphia, Mississippi, long before your times. And it was still a rather uh, dodgy time. Uh, things in the South were still very unsettled. On the weekends, I would buy uh, sacks of flour and rice and carry them out to tent cities of sharecroppers who lived in uh, tent cities in, in Greene County on the Mississippi border. These uh, sharecroppers, black sharecroppers, having been evicted from their uh, land for registering to vote. Now, that sounds very strange to you now. Imagine. Um, the transformation from 1965 to 2008. Look who got elected. Totally beyond my uh, comprehension. And around uh, the end of that academic year, the head of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, which you probably also have never heard of, a man named Stokely Carmichael, who was much in national news, came over to me, put his arm around me, and said, Bob, I think this job is getting too political for you meaning that was the time when the, the, the black uh, students wanted to run the show themselves and they didn't want interference from white northern liberals who were coming down and trying good-naturedly and with good intentions to help out. 
Still, it was an extraordinary experience. I was the biology department for this small college. Um, I taught four courses each semester. So when my colleagues moan about having to teach half or one course, I, I raise my eyes and don't say anything. Uh, <laughs> because I was truly exhausted at the end of every day. But I think to this day that was enormously beneficial. Among other things, it convinced me uh, that learning the teaching, which many of you have to do because you're graduate students, is really an extraordinarily important part of one's scientific education. Not only is it a good citizen-like thing to do, not only do we owe our students uh, the same thing that our teachers taught us, but also it's very good for clearing the mind, for making one's oneself a bit more articulate, um, for allowing one to write papers better, for allowing one to get up in front of uh, diverse audiences and explain what one is doing. I often think of many of my colleagues to this day who work in research institutes where they never teach, and they say proudly, oh no, I don't have to teach. And then I hear them get up on the podium and they start talking, and I realize these are people who've never had to explain clearly to uh, freshmen what they're working about, because to this day, many of those people are rather inarticulate and, and conceptually unclear in what they're trying to impart. I, I'm, putting, I'm saying this just as a plug to explain and to extol the virtues of teaching, because it actually, I think, is very important for one's scientific career. Jerry and I know lots of scientists who are brilliant, truly brilliant and productive, but who are so inarticulate or so unable to convey uh, what they're doing that their work remains relatively unappreciated, underappreciated, given its import. And so I, I, I did my uh, PhD here. These were very exciting times uh, after coming back, much to the surprise of my parents and the MIT biology department. I showed up again in the summer of 1966. I didn't have any uh, shotgun wounds in my side, although a neighbor down there, a white neighbor, threatened as much. Um, and I started working in the laboratory of Sheldon Penman, who, who by now is retired, although he still lives in Brookline, on um, working on a nuclear RNA, because at that time we didn't really understand the metabolism of RNA in, in, um, in mammalian cells. I spent a lot of time working on ribosomal RNA. How do ribosomal, ribosomes get put together? And how, the biogenesis in nucleoli. And then toward the end of my work, I ran acrylamide gels to resolve different RNA species, and I discovered a small, a whole class of small nuclear RNAs, SNRNAs I called them, which somebody else in Texas had discovered, uh, as I found out six months earlier. These are the RNAs that we today associate with uh, the splicing machinery. And it, and it was really interesting and exciting. But I would add, for the uh, sake of you graduate students, that when I ran an RNA gel to resolve RNA species in a cell, I would take a plexiglass tube, I would pour acrylamide into it, allow it to settle. I would layer over the top of that a sample of phenol extracted RNA. I'd run that for a period of three, four, five hours. I'd take the gel, I'd freeze it in a mixture of dry ice and hexane, and then we would take a homemade salami slicer, slice up the, the gel into 60 or 71 millimeter slices, pick each slice up with a, a forceps, put it in a planchette, and put it through a gas uh, 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 reader, which told us the radioactivity. And if I could run one RNA uh, uh, profile or two in a day, um, that was considered a good achievement. And if I got really well-shaped peaks, that was terrific. Now, you guys, you can literally uh, generate uh, information, data, accumulate information between 1,000 and 10,000 times more rapidly than I could then. And I don't think you appreciate the extraordinary, not just marginal, but the extraordinary change in the way that data generation has, uh, has changed over these last uh, three or four decades. Um, of course, now one is confronted with our total inability to interpret almost all the data that we generate with such uh, facility. Um, in, uh, in 1969, I went and, and went off to do two postdocs. Um, and at the time, I was intrigued with the question of how messenger RNA is actually made. We didn't really know what messenger RNA, mammalian messenger RNA looked like. We knew it was there on ribosomes, but we didn't really know its molecular configuration. And no one had actually discovered a discrete messenger RNA species. So I decided to work on SV40 virus. It's a DNA tumor virus, which clones itself each time it grows in a cell, because one 
double-stranded circular DNA molecule generates 100 or 200,000 copies in a lytically infected cell. This was before cloning. Um, and to use that as a way of fishing out the, the um, SV40 uh, encoded messenger RNAs, there were only three or four. And so I spent the next uh, three years, one and a half in Israel at the Weizmann Institute, and one and a half in, uh, in La Jolla at the Salk Institute, parsing out the different messenger RNA species of SV40 uh, RNA and, and found actually some discrete species, something which Susumu Tanigawa had uh, done actually, actually in the La Jolla lab uh, as well be, before my arrival. And again, you think of this as being so primitive and silly. Why would somebody spend three years of his or her life trying to figure out the sizes of messenger RNAs and the fact that they were polyadenylated? But at that time, it was a great challenge, and I figured out some interesting things. One interesting thing I came across was that one of the late messenger RNA species mapped someplace over here to the SV40 genome and someplace over here to the SV40 genome, but not in the middle. And therefore, I was, as probably were many others, this far away from discovering splicing. But of course, I didn't. I just <laughs> passed it on, and, uh, and, and it remained for Phil Sharp uh, two or three years later at Cold Spring Harbor to do so. So in that sense, I guess I wasn't also ran. And when I was at the, uh, I was in, uh, at the Salk Institute in the laboratory of Renato Dalbeco, David Baltimore, whom I'd known well here, had recommended me to go there. He'd been there himself as a, as a postdoc. And uh, Dalbeco came from a, a long line of illustrious um, scientists from Tour in Italy, among whom is Rita Levi uh, Motalcini. She's still alive today at the age of 98 or 99, the, the doyen. Sorry? 100. 100. Time flies. Uh, <laughs> the doyen of uh, uh, Italian uh, biomedical research. And so I was there working in Dolbeco's laboratory. Um, and one day, Salvador Luria came by. Uh, none of you, uh, most of you here, very few of you knew Salvador Luria. He was uh, w one of the stalwarts of the department, one of the leaders. And um, in 1970, 71, Nixon declared a war on cancer. And with that was the announcement that one would like to found a new cancer center. And so Salvador Luria, the bacterial uh, physiologist, bacterial geneticist, was of course the natural person to head this center. He uh, decided to apply for funds to found a non-clinically oriented cancer center at MIT. The rest of the country had uh, cancer centers that were both basic science and clinically oriented. And he decided, uh, therefore, uh, to uh, apply for money, to found one at MIT. He got the money. Uh, MIT bought the former Brigham's Chocolate Factory across the street. And in 1971, it was rehabbed to form the new MIT Cancer Center. Uh, by, and by 1974, one could move in. Uh, in 72, uh, Luria came by uh, the laboratory of Dolbeco. They were both students together in, in, in the Salk. And he approached me and told me I was going to be part of the new cancer center. He didn't ask me. He told me. And I said, oh, and demurred for a couple of days, pretending indifference, until I finally said, OK, I'll do it. And so uh, I came back here to MIT, uh, totally unexpected. Um, I wanted to go back to the East Coast, because my parents were then in the midst of dying. And so it was, a, it was a good opportunity. But it wasn't as if I had planned to come back to MIT. And it certainly wasn't as if I went out and, like most honest people, looked for a job. I, I just followed orders. Uh, but I was not averse to doing so, because MIT was then, as it is now, an extraordinarily interesting place with many fabulous colleagues. It remains that. Um, and it's a decision I never made, um, I never regret. Um, People say to me sometimes, how could you stay at one place for so long? We all know the lives of academic gypsies who spend three years here, 14 years there, five years there. And each time, each place they settle down, they make friends, social friends, colleagues. And then after a period of time, they and their families are rooted, uprooted and moved to some other place. And there's never any constancy in their lives, uh, never any social robust social network never any lifelong friends whom one can associate with. And so I have no regret having been a stick in the mud, having never really moved very far, and working now only a couple hundred yards 
from where I was an undergraduate in the dorm at MIT. Uh, if I were still doing the same things that I had done as a graduate student, I think I would be a little bit uh, regretful. But in fact, as you know, this is a very dynamic place. And to the extent one wishes to change one's orientations, there are continually new people coming into one's lab to help one do so. In fact, uh, another confession is to the extent that really interesting and novel ideas have come out of my lab, almost invariably, almost without exception, they've not come out of my head, but come out of the head of new people coming into the lab. I, I recall uh, most amusingly the, the work of uh, Chris Counter. He came into my laboratory about 10 years ago, and he said to me, uh, uh, hi, I'm, I'm new to the lab. I said, of course, I know that. Uh, <laughs> um, I said to him what I tell all new postdocs, I want you to spend the next two or three weeks talking with everybody in the lab, seeing what they're doing, reading, because these are the most important two or three weeks of your postdoctoral career, because you can figure out which direction you're gonna go into. And I don't wanna be there telling him, you're gonna work on this, and you're gonna be work on, on that. I, I think people have to be enthusiastic about what they're working on rather than considering it a job assignment. And so he came back to me about two weeks later and he said, Bob, I'm gonna work on telomerase. I would like to work on telomerase, he said, being uh, polite and, and Canadian. And I said uh, to him, well, that's all well and good. It's a great topic. It's very interesting. It has intersections with cancer research. But I can't let you do that because you worked as a, as a graduate student on telomerase. And it's my holy duty as your postdoctoral advisor to push you in a new direction. So you broaden your intellectual horizons. And he said, that's really very important and an excellent idea. And about a week later, he recruited another postdoctoral fellow, Matthew Meyerson, as he's called, and they began to work together on telomerase. <laughs> uh, so uh, I, I had then and have no illusions about what influence I have about people uh, <laughs> uh, on people in my lab. I, I say that because that turned out to be a very productive and interesting line of research, which once again, as time and again, came from the head, from the mind of somebody in my lab, a graduate student or a postdoc, rather than from any insights or, or, or creativity or leaps of logic that I may have had. In 1972, I came back, MIT, following Luria's orders. Uh, Luria put together a, 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 what I think was a terrific cancer center. It still resides in that same grubby building, soon to be replaced by the new Koch Center, as we all know. And he recruited uh, a number of uh, faculty, among them, Professor Herman Eisen, who you haven't reached 100 yet, but you're, you're only 10 years away. Um, and uh, it, it was a very heady atmosphere. In 1970, uh, Baltimore had discovered reverse transcriptase at the same time as uh, Howard Temin. And his, so his laboratory, which had previously been focused on the replication of RNA viruses, now was refocused on how uh, retroviruses were able to uh, proliferate. And I saw the, the writing on the wall that it would be unproductive for me to continue to study um, the uh, life cycle of SV40. And so I began to work with murine leukemia viruses, trying to figure out the products of reverse transcription in recently infected cells. Now, note, by the way, that both SV40 and murine leukemia viruses are tumor viruses. But in both cases, working on these viruses, uh, uh, these tumorigenic viruses, was in one sense influenced by the fact that they were useful tools to understand molecular biology. I didn't really care that SV40 caused cancer or that murine leukemia viruses caused cancer. They just were useful viruses to tease out uh, profoundly interesting molecular uh, biological um, traits of, of cells as a whole. And so uh, my, my research began. Uh, a student in 1973 uh, revealed to me the procedure of transfection, the fact that you could take naked DNA and put it into the cell with calcium phosphate precipitate, something you all take for granted then, but then was very new. Uh, his name was David Smotkin. And so we began to transfect murine leukemia virus proviral DNA into cells, and lo and behold, out came virus particles. That was really a big thrill. Um, and then in, in 1975, uh, another student began to transfect the, the genomes of Harvey sarcoma virus, and Harvey sarcoma virus is another murine retroviruses. It carries a transforming gene that it uses actually to transform cells. And lo and behold, the transfected cells that had acquired the DNA became transformed. And, uh, and around 1975, I had another, I opened another facet in my life. 
I'd always wanted to build things. I always wanted to be out in the country. And so 1975, I bought 48 acres for an enormous amount of money, $300 an acre, in uh, southern New Hampshire. And uh, on my first date with my wife-to-be in 19, uh, that year, I showed my wife the topological map of the recently uh, um, purchased plot of land and told her that I, and as implicitly was the case, she would be building a cabin there. And so in uh, 1976, uh, I began to build a cabin there. Occasionally, we had what were called lab concrete pouring parties where, uh, <laughs> where we needed to uh, move large amounts of concrete to pour foundations uh, up a hill in, in pickup trucks, followed by large beer parties. Um, and, and, and by 1967, 68, uh, we had a habitable dwelling there, which I added on later. And, and that has really become uh, a passion in my life. Um, ultimately, if I had my druthers, I would be a carpenter and a gardener, because that's what I really enjoy doing. Now, mind you, I'm not objecting to doing what I do here. <laughs> but if you ask me when I'm in Nirvana, it's when I'm walking around our garden in New Hampshire with mud-caked overalls, grubbing around in the, in the soil, splitting uh, wood, or, or, um, or doing carpentry or electrical work. That's what I really like. But of course, one doesn't earn a living that way. Uh, and so I come here uh, five or six days a week and uh, pretend to be a biologist for, for what it's worth. Um, in 1978, I had a revelation. If we could take DNA from Harvey sarcoma virus transformed cells, the DNA having, the viral genes having integrated themselves into the chromosomal DNA, take that DNA and put it into normal cells and transform the latter, which in fact we could do, this suggested to me something which I thought was truly a brilliant insight. Maybe if one had cells that had been uh, transformed through exposure to a mutagenic chemical carcinogen, maybe those cells also carried transforming genetic information, oncogenes. And if we could take those, the DNA from those cells and put it into normal cells, maybe the latter would become transformed. Now, the fact of the matter is, in those years, we had no idea what happened when you exposed a cell to a chemical carcinogen. We knew the cells started to grow abnormally. There were indications from the work of one of Jerry's mentors, Bruce Ames, that compounds that are carcinogenic are also mutagenic, but nobody had any idea about the nature of the genes inside the cells which ostensibly underwent change. So I had this terrific idea. It came to me in the, during the blizzard of 1978 when Boston was shut down and when I was trudging through three feet of snow across the Longfellow Bridge over to Beacon Hill where I lived at the time. And I said to myself, wow, this is terrific. This is the most original idea I've ever had. Um, and then, uh, and, and I, I got a new graduate student um, who had come to me as a refugee from Professor Howard Green's lab. That hadn't worked out, and he came to my lab, and obviously this had to work out because he didn't want to have a second failed uh, uh, doctoral experience. And I said, why don't you work on this? And of course he said compliantly, sure. And he started working on it and started getting some interesting results. And then about six weeks later, I came to realize that long before the uh, 78 blizzard, there was an article that had appeared in, in, in Nature magazine by a man who worked up in, uh, in um, Canada, which described exactly the same thing, taking DNA from CHO cells, Chinese hamster ovary cells, and using it to transform normal cells, and thereby demonstrating that, in fact, the DNA of the CHO cells carried transforming oncogenic information. And so I was a little bit let down uh, by this because, in fact, I, I became convinced of what probably was the case, that I'd somehow read this article, stuffed it in the back of my brain, and somehow lived with the illusion that this was my idea, when, in fact, it had come from this article in Nature. And then this person uh, was invited first to give a, uh, a um, seminar at Harvard. I went and attended it, and uh, I was both extraordinarily impressed and extraordinarily depressed. The work that was shown was so vast uh, that it was far beyond anything my laboratory could ever do. And it was beautiful data. Uh, and it indicated to me that this guy had already done more than my own laboratory could do for the next 10 or 20 years, just the vast amount of data. And I went up to, them, to this guy and I said, you know, we're beginning to get results just like these. And he said, really? And he was very excited. 
Now, I will tell you that usually when you have somebody coming up to you after a seminar and telling you that they're getting exactly the same results as you have recently been getting, you have mixed feelings. On the one hand, it's nice to feel confirmed uh, in your findings, but on the other hand, you begin to feel the, the hot breath of competition <laughs> on the back of your neck. But he, was, he had unalloyed pleasure at this, um, which I sort of registered and then tucked away. And then about six weeks later, uh, I heard that this guy was being invited to give a talk at the MIT Cancer Center. Uh, indeed, to give a talk on the work which I myself had just begun. I found that a little bit of a letdown to think that my colleagues would want to hire somebody to do something that I was doing. But whatever, I was not in a position to say anything, and so I just bucked up, tucked in at a stiff upper lip, and awaited the uh, forthcoming seminar. Uh, of a speaker who was also invited to Cold Spring Harbor and, and in the Harvard Biolabs. He was being wooed everywhere. And just before he was to come, David Baltimore swung around from his office into mine and said, you won't believe what happened. I said, well, what happened now? He said, well, this guy's boss in Toronto has just thrown him out of the lab. I said, what? He said, yeah, they, they sent a paper to sell to be reviewed. Uh, and one of the reviewers, whom I learned later was Richard Axel, calculated how many Petri dishes would need to, be, need to have been used in order to carry out this work, and, dis and calculated that it was more Petri dishes than were used in all of Eastern Canada that year. <laughs> and so it turned out, although the guy to this day never admitted any wrongdoing, that this idea that he had was maybe right on the mark, but all the data that he had published, including the data I saw at this Harvard seminar, all came out of his brain rather than from his lab bench. I was convinced that the, the, the lab in which he was working had thrown its entire resources with dozens of postdocs and technicians on this project, when in fact this guy had done it on his own, even without the help of the one technician he had. And so he, he was, uh, as it were, uh, momentarily exiled from science. Uh, and we went ahead, of course, working in a field that was by now terribly tainted. Nobody believed this kind of work for the next years because it was clear that at least in its first birthing, uh, it, had, uh, it was tainted by what can only be called fraud and, and, and deception. And so we began to get interesting results. Um, and uh, they involved looking through pet at Petri dishes for little foci of transformed cells. Now, to be honest, to detect such foci uh, was an act of great uh, subjectivity. Was this a focus or was this spontaneously uh, transformed cells? And so we would do experiments where um, a, uh, the student doing the work would give me a whole series of Petri dishes and I would write codes on them so that when he counted the foci, he would not know which cells had been exposed to DNA from cancer cells and which cells had been exposed to normal DNA. And I called, this was a double blind experiment or as I, came to call it the blind leading the blind experiment. And, and in uh, the spring of, of uh, 1979, we got some really uh, interesting and convincing results that the DNA of, of uh, chemically transformed cancer cells really had oncogenic information in it. And, um, and I, I remember talking about it at a Gordon conference uh, that summer, and, and, one, and years later, seeing the notes of somebody who'd listened to that lecture in which he wrote down all the data that I presented and wrote underneath it, not very convincing. <laughs> well, so I had a critical audience. Um, but it became more and more solid, and, and, and soon one discovered that there were other such transforming oncogenes. Um, <clears throat> and there were actually other instances of, uh, of uh, fraud, and, uh, which I won't get into. In, in that field in those years, uh, simply because some of the people who were responsible for them are still around and who knows, might be very litigious if I were to open my overly voluble mouth. Um, so that really was for me a, 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 a view into the, into the underlying roots, into trying to figure out what it was that made cancer cells tick. Um, there were other uh, experiments in the years that, ca that came uh, thereafter. Uh, uh, in 1983, Hartmut Land discovered you needed two oncogenes to transform cells. In 1985 or 86, a new uh, MD came to my laboratory, MD, PhD, called Stephen Friend. He said, I want to clone the retinoblastoma gene. I said, what? 
He said, yeah, this is a tumor suppressor gene. It's very interesting. I said, how on earth are you going to do that? You don't know anything about cloning. Nobody knows exactly where it is in the chromosome, th chromosome 13. He said, don't worry, I'll do it. <laughs> and so he collaborated. He struck up. He's, he's very voluble and enthusiastic. And he struck up a collaboration with a, a guy across at Mass Iron Ear Infirmary called Ted Dreiger. And Ted Dreiger had developed a series of probes along different segments of chromosome 13. And lo and behold, one of the probes, there were three or four of them along this entire enormous chromosome, one of the probes landed right in the middle of the RB gene and allowed it to be cloned out. Now, you know how many megabases each human chromosome is long, and you know how astronomically unlikely this stroke of luck was or is. But it happened, um, uh, and this is what's called an unearned run. It was a terrific uh, <laughs> finding. But I, I'm not proud to have been associated with it because I really didn't have much to do with it. It happened on my watch. And so I'm a little wary of taking credit for it because on the one hand, it, it, it came from uh, Steve Friend's irrational enthusiasm, uh, totally irrationally logical. And on the other, uh, from, from the dumb luck of having a probe somewhere along the multi-megabase chromosome, which was sitting right in the middle of um, the, uh, the gene. Amusingly, uh, six months later, there was another cloning uh, paper uh, of the retinoblastoma gene. And this other group had cloned a gene that uh, was called esterase D, which was located nearby on the chromosome, and reported taking this gene and then moving down the chromosome, clone by clone by clone, to ultimately land in the retinoblastoma gene. Wow, you might say. But if you read that paper, you realize there was no way on earth that could have been done, because you may know that chromosome walking is extremely difficult, if not impossible. And he would have had to go on for years walking down a very long chromosome. The problem being when you do that walking, you never know whether you're going for, forward or backward. It was a mess. So there's all these little adventures. Um, in uh, 1999, I told you about uh, Chris Counter's uh, foray into telomerase, which turned out to be interesting and important because it enabled the creation of the first experimentally transformed human cells. Uh, until 1999, we believed that human cells were not transformable, and, but came to learn the missing ingredient was telomerase. And in, in, 19, uh, in 2003, Jing Yang and Sendo Raimani in my lab started working on genes for uh, metastasis because that remained and remains to this day the, really the big frontier in cancer research. We don't really understand how cancer cells get out of a primary tumor and see uh, new colonies and distant sites, which ultimately represent uh, the source of 90% of cancer-associated mortality. So Jerry, I understand that you routinely uh, take questions at the end of these hours? Uh, I always take questions, yes. <laughs> well, I, 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 I was told to leave time for questions. And so I've hurried along so that uh, I can uh, respond uh, to to some of your questions. I, I've been in this department now on and off, as you can imagine, since 1960. Uh, but I still find it an exhilarating experience to be here. Uh, this is a very unusual place. There are many uh, departments across the country where each laboratory is its own isolated barony, where different faculty members uh, begrudge each other's success, uh, where there are all kinds of internal internecine disputes Never forget, here's an important concept, never forget something that someone once said, which is that the reason why academic disputes are so nasty and bitter is that the stakes are so low. <laughs> Imprint that on your mind for the next 50 years. But that, fortunately, has not been the case here. Uh, I have, I can say truthfully, wonderful colleagues. We get along. We enjoy each other's company. And we have a uh, departmental uh, sociological culture where people talk to one another. And there's enormous amounts of cross-fertilization going on every day and every hour in different uh, arms of the, of the institution. And imagine what's going to be the case now over the next couple of years where the four pillars of the department, Building 68, the Whitehead, the Cancer Center, and the Broad, will all be within 50 or 100 yards of one another. Uh, most major institutions who have uh, cognate, uh, who have departments with cognate interests related, are scattered all over the place. Uh, UCSF has just built a campus in Mission Bay, which is a 20-minute drive 
from their, their homeland campus. And yet here we are all thrown together into the same cauldron and all able to really uh, interact uh, in this really wonderful, formidable uh, scientific community. So um, I don't know whether any of you have any questions. I would not want to presume to. Uh... Is that Laurie in the back there? I was just curious where your interest in your foreign language came from. And... Because I know you oh. speak quite a few. Well, I, I, I grew up speaking German and English, German before English. When I went to elementary school in Pittsburgh, I spoke with a sick German accent, which lasted about two months. And then I started speaking Pittsburgh English, which is not that much of an improvement. Um, <laughs> uh, my, my father had a uh, brother who went to the Netherlands before the war. His wife was not Jewish, and so he was not deported because they had three kids together, and so uh, he, sur he survived the fate of having to go to uh, Westerbork and Auschwitz. And so I have three cousins over there, and when I'm with them, I had to speak Dutch, which is sort of halfway between German and English. I did a postdoc in Israel where uh, I went out with a girl whom I promised to teach English, but of course, we did exactly the opposite. So my Hebrew actually is not so bad. When I was a graduate student here at MIT, um, I thought it was important, I had the illusion it was important, for every educated scientist, biologist, to know German, French, and Russian. Those were the fundaments of our language, uh, of our science, of our discipline. And so I took Russian, which I still remember some elementary uh, conversational Russian. Uh, my mother was born in Strasbourg, in Alsace. She was a big Francophone. And my sister has lived in Paris for 30 years. So uh, I, I, I can kind of get along in French as well and, and read the newspapers and things like that. Uh, in this country, you know, if you speak two languages, you're considered an absolute genius. <laughs> but in places like the Netherlands or Switzerland, the mailman speaks four or five languages. <laughs> and, and in many parts of Europe, people naturally spoke three, four, five, six languages. There's even people, there's even primitive Stone Age tribesmen in the middle of New Guinea who are years from being literate, who are in little tribes surrounded by four or five other tribes that speak totally non-cognate language. And by the age of six, these little kids can speak four or five non-cognate languages perfectly. So uh, I'm just a victim like these uh, st Stone Age kids in Papua New Guinea of, of history. Uh, and, and when I go visit cousins in Israel, uh, the conversation will start out in Hebrew, switch to perfect German, they speak perfect German, in the mid-sentence and then end up in English and nobody even notices it. And, and people think, well, that's a wonderful gift or, or feat, but it, it's just a, an artifact of history. It's, it's not some particular talent. D does that kind of explain things? <laughs> More than you wanted to know? Um, you say that all the ideas that you have come from other people and that it's all luck, but your lab is really successful and really original. So why? Well, I will not accept necessarily success or originality for reasons of upbringing, as I explained earlier. Um, uh, the fact is, if somebody comes to me with an idea, then we'll, re we'll wrestle through it. And, and first of all, I'll ask, the, ask them the question, is, is, the question that's being, is there a question being posed? And is the question being posed an interesting one? Or will it just simply data, uh, generate lots of data? because there are certain people in this world who are interested in accumulating lots of data, observations about things, but are totally uh, bewildered if they have to f draw some interesting conceptual take-home lessons from this. So I always put a lot of pressure on the people in my laboratory to um, tell me, where is this work going to go, and what take-home lesson it's going to teach us? And if it teaches us a take-home lesson, is it something that's really important and of interest, or something that will be of interest to two or three other people in the world, and soon forgotten. So it's that uh, metric that I, that I apply to uh, what's going on in my laboratory. And to the extent um, it's been interesting or creative, it's because I forced people into being able to reply and to me and to defend what they're doing as being something that really will create a new paradigm of some sort. Not a milestone, but at least a new way of thinking about a problem. So it's really a, a point of view. Um, and even though I like to tinker and take things apart, like electric train sets or pinball machines, um, I, I've been averse to having people in my laboratory spend years trying to figure out new connections in intracellular circuit wiring diagrams. 
because although those are interesting and par perhaps important, uh, I, they're not conceptually that interesting. So it's, it's this uh, metric of conceptual interest which I, I, I kind of impose on people as having to meet. And as sometimes it works, and sometimes people smile at me and tell me implicitly, leave them alone, go away, and let me do what I'm doing. And I respect that because just because I think something is important or unimportant doesn't mean they think so. And I, I come to realize that people in my laboratory are no more or less important than I am in many senses. And I think that um, has in many ways uh, conditioned the kind of work uh, that, that we do. By the way, I'm not the only one in this department who was and is an ob artifact of, uh, of mid-20th century history. Uh, there were, uh, let's see, how many other refugees? Vernon Ingram came from Breslau. Boris Magazanik, he's passed away. I don't know if many of you knew him. Uh, Boris Magazanik came from Vienna, as did Lisa Steiner. And uh, these three people actually lived through those times in, in Central Europe, unlike myself. Have I missed somebody? Harvey Lodish? I thought you were from Cleveland. No, you were. <laughs> <laughs> you you spoke. Who passed away? Vernon Ingram. Yes. Right. Not Boris. <laughs> oh, did I? Did I? <laughs> Vernon Ingram it's a passed. I, I'm sorry. Clear. It was a run on sentence. I'll punctuate that's better. English. That's English. That's English. <laughs> so uh, I, uh, yes, and. and but I, I will tell you, I, I'm not about to say that they were marked by the same kinds of impressions that I grew up with, because each of us lived through a quite different life. And, and, and for them, it was maybe very, very early years when they didn't realize what they were in the midst of, or maybe have kind of sloughed it off. I don't know. So if you're ever interested in how mid-20th century history affected them, ask Lisa and ask Boris about life in Vienna. Or uh, if you're really interested, read Eric Kandel's book, uh, who, who lived through those times as well, probably a couple blocks from where Boris was growing up. Let's see. So people have been doing research really very intensely on cancer since, let's say, 1970. Yes. Survival. In fact, some cynics say more people are living off of cancer than dying from it. But <laughs> <laughs> you didn't hear that. What is your, I mean, I'm sure that I guess that in the 70s people thought, this is it. We have the oncogenes, we are going to have the cure in a few years. What, what is your, your view after, you know, 40 years of working on this that, except for, let's say, Gleebach and a few other uh, isolated examples, really the promise has not lived to its height or hope? Well, we, we started, the war, Nixon's war on cancer was dedicated to proving that uh, retroviruses caused human cancer. And of course, it was a total failure. They didn't. But it funded an enormous amount of work that led to the discovery of many of the genetic determinants of cancer, oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes. The fact is, we did that work, and we continue to do that work, because we had the ethic that if we don't understand the roots of cancer, the underlying machinery, we'll never be able to generate new cures. And if the truth be told, um, <clears throat> over the last uh, 33 years, we started from a place in 1975 when we knew absolutely nothing about why cells misbehave to now when we know enormous details about it. The sad fact is, however, that with the exception of these uh, recently cited cases, uh, there have been very few advances made in trying to figure out how we're going to treat advanced solid tumors. Pancreatic cancer is still a death sentence, as is, lung, uh, as is advanced lung cancer, and stomach cancer, and esophageal cancer. Um, and to the extent that death rates have gone down from many kinds of cancers, some of them have been um, from diagnosis, like the pap test and cervical carcinoma, and others have been from uh, different um, lifestyle practices, like, for example, the, the precipitous decline in um, uh, stomach cancer due to refrigeration of food over the last 60 years and the use of food preservatives. Don't tell the organic people that. Um, so, uh, but still, advances in the therapy of solid tumors have not, have not really happened, major advances. Will they happen? I believe so, yes. But cancer cells have proven to be much more f formidable adversaries than any one of us would have imagined. But gradually, pieces are falling together in the puzzle. And I think we're going to find some, some over the next 10 years, figure out how to use drugs in combination that we hadn't thought of before. They're really going to have effects. Um, the field is still changing. Five years ago, nobody 
talked about cancer stem cells. Nobody believed they existed in solid tumors. And now we know they exist, and now we know that they represent an important component of the resistance of solid tumors to therapy and the ability of solid tumors to regrow after therapy. So it's not as if we understand the entire volume, the entire book. And, um, but it has been the case that this one third of a century long investment in trying to understand the roots of cancer has only paid off minimally in terms of real declines in the truly life-threatening uh, malignancies. Interestingly, um, breast cancer, you, you all heard about the breast cancer um, epidemic of the last uh, uh, 30 years, 40 years. So here is the incidence of breast cancer over the last 40 years. It's gone up age-adjusted incidence of breast cancer. And here's the age-adjusted mortality of breast cancer for the last 30 years. Um, and then it's gone down by 15 or 20 percent. So here we have two interesting stories. One, the epidemic is an illusion. More and more women are diagnosed with breast cancer, but of a kind that wouldn't kill them anyhow. Age-adjusted mortality hasn't changed for three or, three or four uh, decades. And actually, like, over the last uh, five, six, seven years, there's been a 15 to 20 percent decline in age-adjusted mortality, which indeed is a real testimonial to the fact that something is happening in terms of treatment. So uh, people say, well, are, is there going to be one big battle where we finally win the war against cancer? And I always answer, uh, absolutely not. It's going to be a series of small skirmishes where we make progress here and there and there, and once in a while have some home runs like Gleevec, for example. But it's, I, I would have hoped for more now, um, and, and it's certainly been a disappointment. But it's not been due to, to the fact people aren't working hard, or as many lay people say, to the fact that these scientists just don't talk to one another. My God, I spend all my time on airplanes and doing emails to talk with literally hundreds of other cancer researchers every year. So it's just proven to be a very formidable uh, adversary, disappointingly so. We, would, we had hoped that it would be easier to attack, but it's a much more complex disease than is, for example, cardiovascular disease, which has proven indeed to be a, uh, a, a, a treatment that one can um, really uh, address this successfully. How do you keep on top, or how should a scientist keep on top of all of the information that's out there? If you PubMed a particular thing that you're interested in, you may get thousands of articles that come up every month. Yes, so people say, how do you keep on top of all these things? And actually, I don't read the journals that much. <laughs> <laughs> I talk with people because I find that it's very inefficient for me to open up every issue of science and nature and cell and read what's in there. It's just, there's too much. So I know lots of people, you know lots of people. I ask them, what's new in your field? But I don't ask them in that sentence. I ask them a question about this or that. We have journal club two or three times a week in my lab where people talk about new papers. Um, and uh, so for me, it's, it's the, the oral and aural route which informs my thinking. Um, I, uh, I wrote a cancer biology textbook, as Jerry mentioned, which is 600 pages long, but it didn't involve looking through PubMed uh, for the latest findings. It involved with just talking to people and going to meetings and hitting up people for interesting slides that I could use as figures in the textbook. <laughs> I'm known as a leech now. Whenever I come to cancer research meetings, people say, uh-oh, there's Weinberg around. He must want a PowerPoint from me. <laughs> So it, it, it's a very informal, and you might even say half-assed way of accumulating information. <laughs> but it works for me. And I suspect it works for more people than one would uh, like to admit. Because the, the, the plethora of information is just overwhelming. When I was a graduate student, there were two journals one paid any attention to. Journal of Molecular Biology, JMB, and PNAS. That was it. Today, more than the stars in the sky. I think PubMed now has 12 or 15 million papers in it. And, and the only way you could, I can deal with this is to continually ask people who've distilled in their own minds how this or that problem is evolving. Maybe that's not the answer you wanted. <laughs> and there was one more question. Maybe we'll break then. Or maybe there wasn't. Well, thanks. Very good. I, I am again stunned. So many people came to hear the life of someone whom I don't consider to be that interesting. Thanks for coming. Thank you.